Hi there, Glocal citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, and I'm coming to you again from Accra on a sunny Monday afternoon in March, which is, I think we're kind of waiting for a little bit of rain because it's quite dry. Like the dust still hasn't quite settled from the Harmattan, but We'll take it. It is what it is. And my guest is coming to me, thankfully, from the same time zone, but in a different part of the world. She is a lawyer, consultant, and communication strategist with 18 years experience in the public and private sectors. Her clients include the World Bank, United Nations Development Fund, UNICEF, the Department for International Development, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the U.S.'s National Democratic Institute, to name a few. She is the former CEO of the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund and is currently a director at the Open Society Foundations. A published author with a series of children's textbooks, on social studies used in primary schools and a children's reference book on Nigeria. Her first book, Love Does Not Win Elections, chronicles her experiences in the electoral process in Nigerian politics. She kept a weekly column for five years, first as the pedestrian lawyer in This Day newspaper, and most recently as the Nigerian citizen for the Leadership newspaper. A regular commentator on radio and television, she has been involved in numerous campaigns to improve social justice for women and girls, governance in Nigeria, and is an experienced advocate on gender and social justice issues. Aisha Osori, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Florence. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Wonderful. Yes, from uh, not so sunny London. So you're in sunny <laughs> and okay. skies overcast London. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, let's get started. You've given us a little bit about where you're local, but let's go with the where are you from, where are you local, and what is your craft? Where am I from? Where am I local? Well, I guess I am from Nigeria. Mm-hmm. And where am I local is a very interesting question, actually, because for the last couple of years, I have not spent longer than a year in any place. So 2018, I started out towards the end of 2018. I was in Senegal, Dakar. By mid 2019, I was in Berlin, Germany, spent the year into the pandemic there, then moved to Abuja for another less than a year and then have been in London for another less than a year. So It's very difficult to say where I'm local, but I will say now something that, you know, when I was younger, I didn't didn't think about. When I lived in New York, I always felt home was, of course, Nigeria, and I would always be making plans to be back there. But now I've realized that wherever I am, you know, however long I'm going to be there, and sometimes I don't know, that that place is going to be where I'm local. That place is home. So wherever I am is home right now. Um, So home is London. Mm, okay. Okay. That's, that's good. That's a great perspective, particularly for a stamped and sealed local citizen, because you've been just in that short, just in the short span of the recent past, you've been in many countries. So what would you say is your craft? Well, my craft would be, oh my God, another good question. Well, I think my craft is writing. I say, I think because I don't really earn any money <laughs> from writing, mm. <laughs> but it is the thing that gives me the most joy and fulfillment so i in my brain since i've been like six seven years old i am a writer whether it's scribbling down poems or you know writing short stories or even just writing my journal constantly and yeah i'm dreaming about writing all the time so my craft is writing but unfortunately Uh i've not been able to earn a living from just writing okay okay so so tell us what is your first memory of actually putting pen to paper and creating a story. Funny you said that because it was, it's been on my mind. Um, I think the first, I can't remember the first that I remember being published, that's easier. Uh So the writing part, not so easy, but the published part, I must have been in class four, as we call it in Nigeria, which is primary four. So I would have been eight, nine. Uh Um, Yes. About eight, nine. And a friend, a classmate, Andrea Ahime, who I've lost touch with. And if she's, if she happens to be listening, I'm looking for you, Andrea. Um, <laughs> Andrea Ahime and I wrote a poem that was read out to the entire school. And I remember being so 
I don't know what the word is. Shame is not the right word, but so I guess abashed that my name was being called out in public to the uh-huh. old school uh-huh. that I hid under the table while they were reading my poem. So. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 oh goodness. So you turn from the from the girl who wrote the poem to the girl who hid under the table. <laughs> right, exactly. And well, but now no more hiding under the table. It's very happy to to get the accolades when I can get them. Yeah. Of course, of course, of course. Oh, that's a that's a lovely story. It reminds me of my writing, right? When I was about the same age, we had a writing competition in school and we all had mm-hmm. to it was a whole process we not only we we had to write little books right so we wrote a book had to illustrate it mm-hmm. create the cover mm-hmm. and all these things and i can remember this being my first all nighter to write this and get it in and so mm-hmm. then fast forward to college and it was all nighters for whatever but i really like as a 9 year old was like i'm going to stay up all night and finish this because i was so committed to it and it paid off because i won the mm-hmm. award for the whole school Excellent. And got to go on to a citywide, um, citywide, you know, fair book fair competition. I didn't win there, but but just the experience mm-hmm. of knowing, you know, I, I absolutely understand how it feels to just finally, you know, get your words out and people seeing them and appreciating them. So, yeah. So do you consider yourself a writer still? I mean, are you still? I writing? do. I do. Okay. I do. I do. Right. So in my, you know, similarly to you, I think children is one of the areas where I, I focus a lot of my attention. So creating content mm-hmm. for children and educational, informational content. So we can talk a little bit more about your work in that space, <laughs> moving on a little bit. So now you, your craft is writing, but you don't get paid for it or you're not yes. earning a living necessarily for it. So how how did you evolve into the person that you are now so that you actually have the time to claim writing as, I guess, your leisure, but as um, the person who is the public figure that we know? How did you come to to find yourself in that space? Well, very, very circuitous route. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and and I, it's funny, I was just having a conversation with someone just yesterday saying, and to be honest, I don't feel like I've finished evolving yet. Oh, um, no, never. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I know well, but, you know, sometimes I envy people who know what they want to do their entire lives and do it, you know, and sometimes I think about people like Bill Gates or I guess... Um, who founded Apple? What's the guy's name? Steve Jobs. Jobs. You know, they just, they mm-hmm. found one thing they did and they did it, they've done it their whole lives, even though I guess now Bill Gates has branched out into philanthropy, but he did Microsoft for like, what, how many decades? But yeah, I I wanted to be a doctor, like all good Nigerian children <laughs> wanting to make their parents happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, somewhere in the, towards the end of, secondary school, I sort of realized that, yeah, medicine would not be a really good fit for me considering how squeamish I am. And just not really at that time, I would have said empathetic, you know, in in a way that I would, I would think doctors should be. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to do law. My mom was really traumatized and was convinced that it was just watching too many movies that made me, that had glamorized, you know, courtroom drama. (laughs) <laughs> that made me want to be a lawyer because I was a very good science student. I was actually yeah. a very good science student. So sure. She was like, but you're, you're a natural fit. But yeah, I was happy that I went with my goal. But then even then I wasn't a justice warrior that I, that I feel like I am now. I mm-hmm. wanted to do corporate and acquisitions, mergers. Those are the kind of things, you know, I read about in the different novels that glamorizes American capitalism and the movies that I watched. So it was all about being a corporate lawyer, doing mergers, taking over companies and things like that. And so I did my university in Nigeria. Then I went to Harvard Law School for my LLM. And I remember being there with classmates who were doing things like human rights law, environmental. And I was looking at them like, who are these strange people? Like it never occurred to me that I would be interested in that. (laughs) That I would be interested in that type of law. Like my whole focus was, you know, corporations and securities. And anyway, fast forward and life being a Nigerian, I would say, um, taught me that, you know what, being privileged is never enough protection. And the best protection for anyone in any society is that it's there's general protection for everyone, not just mm. protection for privileged people. Mm-hmm. And that's really what got me thinking about the space uh, within which I now came into. 
um, first just through volunteering around social issues and then got a you know an offer to leave the private sector and join the Nigeria Women's Trust Fund, which was a startup at that time. So was the real first substantive CEO of the Nigeria Women's Trust Fund, which has gone from being you know, a small nonprofit that was getting $20,000 grants to one that's getting $1 million grants today. So very happy to have laid that foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that was the journey that took me. It was really a personal realization that no matter how privileged you are, especially as a woman, mm-hmm. you are not patriarchal society ever really fully protected, not by society, not by your class. As long as you step out of what's expected of you, then you will suffer, mm. not because you deserve it, because that's what the society demands to keep, you know, women and girls in check. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that you said you're now a justice warrior because <laughs> <laughs> because we need them, and it's it's important that people claim it and own it in in that role. And so you've come full circle, you started, and I want to ask more about your experience because ultimately you joining the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund as a startup, it seems that that was somewhat of an entrepreneurial experience, right? Because you were the first, you were bringing an organization from the grassroots up, like even though it wasn't necessarily your, I guess, your your invention, so to speak, it kind of offered you the opportunity to mm-hmm. be an entrepreneur in terms of bringing an organization up around is what I'm yes. observing. So tell yes. us about that yes. experience of, of growing a startup into this multi-million dollar organization. Well, I mean, thank you for putting it that way, you know, because I never, I've never have framed it as being an entrepreneur, but now that you said it, it, it yeah, it was in every way a startup. I was, as I said, the first CEO, I inherited two staff an accountant, and I think the program manager who was new as well. The program manager was hired the same time I was. We had dwindling funds in our account, so it sort of put pressure on us to be able to to find money. We were in a small place at the back of, you know, one of the donor agency's offices, and we had, I think, a mandate to move within a couple of months. So it was, you know, there was lots of pressures, Mm -hmm. lots of demand. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, to be honest, I, I can't claim that I did it by myself. I did it by using my network. Sure. I, I just definitely leaned on the people that I knew within the organization who were board members, within my network, both private and within the emerging civil society that I was be- becoming part of. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's what made it. I, I quickly identified some issues like I needed, you know, to change my team. I wasn't mm-hmm. responsible for hiring my team. So in a way, it was also not the typical startup because a startup, usually you start with maybe people who are your fellows yeah. in terms of the vision that you're trying to create. But I inherited two people, but I needed to be strategic about their exit because I couldn't just come in and say, oh, out you go. Mm-hmm. I needed to be able to at least work with them and see how they would perform and if they would have the same vision that I did before I could make a case. And mm-hmm. so while all that was going on, trying to put structures, trying to find a home for us to move to, knowing our deadline, there was also the very pressing need to to raise funds. And then I was lucky I got into the Eisenhower Fellowship, which mm-hmm. is a fellowship based in Philadelphia. It's a six-week fellowship. And typically you get to design a program where you say, you know, while I'm in the States, this, this is my area of focus and these are the people I want to meet. And of course, I designed my program around women's political participation, which is something that's very uh, topical in Nigeria right now, considering mm-hmm. not just International Women's Day, but just on 1st of March in the run-up to International Women's Day, the Nigerian um, National Assembly made up of the upper house and the lower house voted against five gender bills as part of the constitutional amendment. But anyway, this was 20, 2013 and I was in you know in the United States and my, my program was designed um, around trying to see how we can re- increase women's political participation. And it was through all those conversations that I had with academics, think tanks, programs like the NDI, the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, that I first got my seed money of, you know, and they were like, okay, we like you. And I think there is something to be said for that. You know, I feel like if I was sitting in Nigeria, just sending out emails to people who didn't know me, considering I was very new in that field and that space Mm -hmm. uh, of philanthropy and grant making, it would be very different from me being in your office and talking about all the things I want to achieve seeing me, hearing me, you know, I I do think it makes a lot of difference. So I was, there was also a bit of element of luck in my being able to 
be starting that new role and within a couple of months being able to to go to the states for for the Eisenhower fellowship and that's I came back with you know promises of you know grants told me to write my proposal and I did and then I also got into partnerships with other organizations that were involved in political participation generally, you know, because mm-hmm. I felt, okay, we are we might be looking at it for women's political participation, but there are a group of people who are trying to make sure that there's a more enabling environment generally. And if they're doing that, then it also benefits women. So how do I partner with them, work with them? Because while they're trying to achieve their goals, we will also be achieving our goals. And I always say generally, even now that I've left the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund, that you know, when it comes to thinking about what are the things that will help women get into office through elections in Nigeria, and like it's the same things that good men and women are looking for in terms of trying to get into the space. It's more integrity, it's more transparency, it's less ability to rig and manipulate the elections. Those are the mm-hmm. things. It's really democratic primaries of the major parties that will help more women get in. Um, so mm-hmm. I think it was a bit of luck, a bit of using my network, a bit of timing. And they say timing is everything. Again, I've thought about timing a lot, thinking about Obama's um, presidency in 2008. And, you know, just maybe that was Hillary's time as well. It was Hillary's time, it was Obama's time, and only one of them could get it. Um, mm-hmm. And he got it in 2008. And, you know, Hillary just, it was just not her time in 2016. So sometimes right. they say timing is everything. So I think it, timing. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. just for me at that point. Wow, interesting. So did you raise most of your funding from outside of Nigeria or did you also um, you know, equal I, part? I would say most. I would say mm-hmm. most of it. Mm-hmm. Most of the grant. But we had lots of friends of the mm-hmm. fund who like my personal networks who would g- donate money to us just for us to be able to run campaigns. I sure. dug into my savings a few times to be able to write checks for the organization mm-hmm. and yes board members advisory board members would also when we do fundraisers especially towards maybe women's political participation and activities yeah would always go but to be honest it was once if you went to someone once you couldn't go back to them again you know it was yeah. a one-off yeah. thing i have mm-hmm. to say that i didn't i we didn't have the kind of philanthropists who would give and give and give it was mm-hmm. like a one-off mm-hmm. thing we'll give you a check and that's it and it was while they were not big checks they definitely added up so but i think it was a mix we also mm-hmm. partner with INEC. So INEC help. INEC is the Nigerian Independent National Electoral Commission, which is our electoral management body in Nigeria. Partnering mm-hmm. with them was also useful. At that time, it was headed by Professor Jega, who's well known and respected. So mm-hmm. being able to partner with him again, using networks, being able to partner with them to, to work on advocacy around the elections. Um, gave us some funding and also gave us some visibility. And of course, we, as I said, we worked really hard to put ourselves on the table where people were talking about democracy and good elections. So Mm -hmm. we volunteered for stuff. We were, you know, and then, of course, when I said I hired two staff, so (laughs) there were three of us when I started. And from the framework and the budget, we only had room for three people in terms of payments and the, the allowances that we could get from the board. And I had made a case to split one of the roles, make it less senior. So I could mm-hmm. take some money from that salary and match it with a bit of from money from another salary since I was mm-hmm. hiring new people to create what was a very critical role that wasn't there, which is a comms person. There was no communications mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you do very a startup important. without comms? Yeah. 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 Nobody will know you're alive without comms. So exactly. getting a comms person who we could work with, have a website, build a website, yeah. Yeah. populate it, create content. Yes. So that also helped to to give us visibility that we, we really needed. Wow. 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 Entrepreneur that you didn't even know you were. <laughs> <laughs> So you went from that organization and I want to use my why the where question to ask exactly what, why do you find yourself in London at this time in your life? Why the where? How did you come to be living, working and playing where you live? Wow, that's um, interesting. I guess I haven't really I've thought about it and not thought about it. Well, so from Women's Trust Fund, I ended up at uh, Open Society Initiative for West Africa as Mm -hmm. the first as a board member, Mm -hmm. then as the board chair, and then in 2018 as the executive director. Okay. Now, Open Society Foundations worldwide, globally, is going through a transition where we're sort of realigning our programs, realigning what our regions look like, what we work on. And it's it's pretty massive in in the way that 
we were going in Africa from having five foundations, which is the West Africa Foundation, the Southern Africa Foundation, the East African Foundation, the regional office also in Nairobi, and uh, South Africa, which is the only country foundation. We we're going from five foundations in Africa to one. And so, of course, there was you know, going to be people who had to leave from the new structure. And there was an opportunity to work in the London office with the executive vice president. And I took it um, because although it's a very different role from what I've been used to, either as a grantee or as a grant maker in Osiwa, what this role is giving me is perspectives on how large philanthropies run in terms mm-hmm. of the operations, the administration. Mm-hmm. And so for me, when I look at the trajectory of where I've been from 2012, it's almost like I'm in school right now, mm-hmm. um, like mm-hmm. a senior mm-hmm. senior exec program, mm-hmm. because I only moved from the private sector to the development philanthropy sector in 2012. So mm-hmm. in fact, this is my 10th year only. Sure. And what sure. a ride it's been sure. to come from just being a grantee, a small startup, non-profit, and being now in philanthropy with a budget of over a billion dollars a year. And mm-hmm. so being able to sit in one of the hubs and have conversations, not just on West Africa strategy or Africa strategy, but global strategy. And then also looking at the internal mechanics of how philanthropy is run and how we worry about grant making and what kind of tools we're using and you know, what we're doing to the field in terms of when you exit a field, it's, yeah, it's a rich opportunity. And yeah, that's why I'm in London. I'm also in London for personal reasons, because the truth is I could be in any one of the hubs in in Europe or in the global north, as it's called. I, Mm -hmm. I had a choice to be in New York, Berlin or London, but I chose London because of my children. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's not a choice that I've, um, I've made a lot of. I'm not, I'm ashamed to admit it, but in my career, I've generally decided based on what works for me. Um, okay. But for the first time, I was deciding what I thought was based not on me, on, but on my children. You know, they were, they all, we've all been going through transitions. When I mentioned in the beginning that I've been in five countries over the last three years, no, no not five, four countries mm-hmm. over the last three years, it's taken a toll on all of us, you know. Yeah. So this is yeah. the opportunity for us to all be in the same place for the first time in a long time. Oh, wow. Well, that's good. You know, at some point there's there's the, I want to say the familial altruism. <laughs> so you're, you know, you're looking to a lot of organizations. <laughs> Better and, late than never. Yeah. Than never. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and I think you bring a very good point up is that when you are a woman and you have not and goals and you are, you know, and envision and you are a justice warrior, you know, how do you balance, you know, the idea of balance? And and I think I think you mentioned probably the the pandemic may have had a, a bit to do with, you know, how do we come together yeah. and do this? Yeah. But but um yeah. kudos to you for coming to where you needed to be for for yourself and for everyone. Yeah. Because I think by yeah. by serving or making the choice that was for your entire family, you also serve yourself to find peace of mind in that space. So you are in London, you could be anywhere, Mm -hmm. but I want (laughs) to, considering you've been in four countries in the last three years, I want Mm -hmm. to pivot into my global speak question, because I think it's a good point to hear what you hear. So we want to hear what you hear. So I ask you to share a word, a phrase, or saying that has been a meaningful part of your local experience and why or how you came to value it as a local speak. Oh, wow. Oh, hmm. <laughs> just, a, just a sidebar. You were in, in Germany. Um, yes. Do you speak German? No, it's very no. difficult. And it's funny, when you were saying one word, I could only think about danke, danke, okay. uh-huh. which is thank you. And to be honest, I mean, I do feel grateful and I feel like I should say thank you a lot more often. Um, uh-huh. to everyone around me even yeah. just to the universe but I don't speak German I was busy trying to learn French because I was in Dakar um, yes. I thought I was going to be there for a foreseeable future until all the changes happened with the pandemic and the OSF transformation uprooted me from there sure uh, but I would think that honestly English is my num- is my main language so okay um, I'm not sure that there's anything I've learned okay. in English since I moved to England <laughs> In um, August, but I'm thinking, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking very hard. Let's see. Hmm. Is this your first time living in yes. the UK? 
Yes, it is. I have never oh. lived in the UK. I didn't okay. go to school here. So it's all very new. Yeah. Okay. It's, I mean, the longest I've been here maybe is three weeks on a holiday or something. Or maybe when we're children, we stayed for a month or something. I can't even remember. But okay. yes, got it. Didn't even have a bank account. Yeah. It's very, all very new. Yeah. Very new, new town. So I'm sure you'll think of something that's, I mean, I can <laughs> pickle you with some UK Google speak, but uh you Maybe better. you should. <laughs> have, you be, have you lived in England? Have you lived in? in I haven't, but I spend a lot of time there. Oh, okay. in it, in it, yeah, mm-hmm. in it, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> when you hear a lot in it. <laughs> well, I do talk about the weather quite a bit, so I mean that way. I really have become very British. If you ask me how it's going, I, the first thing I'll talk about is the weather. Oh, it's sunny today or it's not raw it's drizzling yeah so i hear that's a particularly very british thing to do okay okay all right so the weather (laughs) that is your weather speak (laughs) (laughs) Ah, okay so let's talk let's talk about let's go back to your writing so okay you you've been writing You've written a book, you, and particularly because you've written a book about one experience that has been, I mean, a, I think a transformational part of your, your life. So tell us mm-hmm. about your book, the, the book Love. Love Doesn't Win Elections? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Tell us about that journey <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, what inspired so, it. I, you know? Yes, definitely. Well, so in, um, I joined the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund in 2012. It was mm-hmm. just after the 2011 general elections that saw in um, President Goodluck Jonathan. So I now had four years, obviously, to try and see how and what we could do to increase the number of women who would be running and winning in 2015, which was the next general elections. And by the time the primaries it was time for the primaries for the parties to get ready for 2015. I had realized that um, not only were we not going to get more women elected, we were not going to get more women like me. And I know people say, well, what do you mean like you? And I just said, well, I mean, generally from my background and my network, if I use my friends, friends of that I grew up with, my, my parents, friends and their kids, we were not the kind of people who get involved in politics. You know, you, there's always been this sense that politics is for people who don't have anything better to do, which is not quite true. I think politics should be everybody's business and Mm -hmm. one of the most important things that we should, as citizens, be all involved in. And I think Mm -hmm. the worse shape your country is, the more you should be involved in the politics to make sure that you can, you know, contribute to changing things. So, and I was beginning to feel like a hypocrite, you know, it's like, okay, I'm spent literally 2012 to 2014. This is about August, September, 2014 trying to get more women to run, trying to make sure that we have fairer electoral acts, laws, provisions, trying to engage the political parties. There had been this huge merger of a couple of parties that came to form the All Progressive Congress, which is the party of the president right now. I was you know, part of many of those conversations and negotiations for what kind of constitution the new party should have, You know, trying to use that opportunity to see how we could make it gender friendly. Maybe they'll have affirmative action. No, 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 no. Nothing really groundbreaking came out of those negotiations, but it was good to take part in them because if you don't take part in it, then, you know, you can't say you tried. So anyway, I now decided that, well, instead of, you know, let me pick up the gun that, you know, instead of going around asking people, you should run, you should run, telling people you should run, I should run, you know, and see how, what I learned from the process. And my God, it was such an eye opener. I just couldn't keep what I learned to myself. You know, mm, mm-hmm. I have to say it was the most fascinating education that I received because it, until then I really didn't know how the political process within the political parties work. You know, you hear a lot of stories, you hear they're not democratic. You know, I've been in civil society for a couple of years and every conversation around democracy, when it, one of the challenges will always be, our parties are lacking in internal democracy. And I would say, but I didn't really know it in the way that I knew it now. And so that's, I couldn't, as I said, I couldn't keep it to myself. And I just decided to write a book because what I realized from that experience was that as much as we like to ask people to go out and vote, mobilize votes, and oh, I, I, I visited with Rock the Vote while I was in, in DC as part of my Eisenhower Fellowship, which is an American organization that uses concerts and music to try and drive people. And it's something that we did in Osiwa as well, working with many important and popular artists like MI, just to have similar concerts, ask people to get their PVCs, which is their permanent voters card. So 
anyway, by the time we're all, you know, charged up on election day trying to vote, the truth is, I think about 80, maybe even 90 percent of the battle for decent leadership has already been lost because mm. we're not at the parties, because we have no, we have no say over who the parties bring forth. And typically, the people that the parties bring forth are not are people who are going to uphold the status quo or who are not going to change things any in any fundamental way, you know. So I couldn't, as I said, sit on that information. And I, I wrote the book. It's funny, I wrote the book for a very long time because first of all, I wrote it as a as a chronicler of, of my life, writing journals. I wrote it as an everyday journal, sort of Bridget Jones type diary type thing. And a good friend read it and she was like, no, 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 this this doesn't work. It's, you know, it's too long. It's boring. It's this, it's that. Why don't you write it around the experiences? So you Mm. chase the first lady, write, dedicate one chapter to chasing the first lady. You know, you had to find the APC, sorry, yeah, the PDP chiefs. So that was the party I ran on them. What, you know, what was that like? And that made perfect sense. So I literally rewrote the book again. And even when I was writing the second, this, writing the book for the second time, I didn't have a title, you know, it was just like, hmm, my experiences in politics, just something bland like that. I knew it was a placeholder, but I didn't have the name. And then while the book was taking shape, I was talking to publishers, I'd finished writing it, but still sort of mulling over what the title would be. We were having a conversation with a bunch of friends and you know, people were waxing lyrical about a particular Nigerian at that time. He's no longer, he no longer has the shine, but at that time he was one of the shine people that people were thinking about for 2015. Oh, would he be great? Or he would have been great? Okay, no, this was even after 2015. He would be great as this and great as that. Anytime there was a poll, his name would be on it. And I was like, guys, 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 love doesn't win elections. And I was like, oh my God. That's the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how that's how love doesn't win elections came to be. Okay, okay. And so I'm I'm curious about some of the detail and not, not to be a spoiler because we want people to put some funds in your pocket to buy the oh, book. No, of course. Carry on. <laughs> but but <laughs> in your what was the most like dramatic aspect of of that journey, would you say, you know, because we hear about when elections come here in Ghana, there's sometimes, and as particularly presidential elections, there's sometimes some tension, right? Because, you know, people are afraid that something's going to go down at the polls or someone who, you know, want to make something happen, isn't able to make it happen. So what was the most dramatic experience that you, you had in that time of your life? Well, I mean, honestly, it would seem very lame, but Mm -hmm. And there were many. I mean, there was me. I'm, I kind of consider myself shy, which many people will probably not believe. But having to get up and sort of explain myself to a bunch of party officials who were clearly hostile and was one dramatic. But I think maybe the real drama must have been when I had to leave my house at like, I think it was past midnight when I got a call, you know, and someone was like, someone being a a net a contact who knew about my political journey and so in nigeria if you're running for office you know trying to get the buy-in of a godfather who yes. sponsor you and basically be on the democratic on your behalf so to speak <laughs> um, so someone was like yeah yeah yeah. there's somebody here you have to meet you have to meet i was already in bed it mm-hmm. was past midnight but i was awake i was you know reading doing something and you have to get, you have to come right away, right away. And this is the address. And I was like, oh my God, you know, like, this is not, I can't call a driver. My driver lives, you know, miles away. And I wasn't going to call him at midnight to come take me anywhere. It wasn't planned. So I had to drive myself. You know, it was a bit scary. Many parts of Abuja are unlit. Um, mm. the, the place wasn't near my place. I lived in, I lived in Metama then. And this place was way across town for people who are listening, who might be from, who know Abuja well, it was, um, Apo legislators quarters, which I honestly, let me try. I, it's like maybe for people who know London, I guess I live in the Wimbledon area and yeah, it's trying to get all the way to the West end somehow. Oh yeah. That's far. Yeah. You know, far away. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and I did that. I went, you know, and then at some, you know, because I was used to waiting around, I went with my laptop, you know, with like a book, just sort of saying, you know, if I'm kept in a waiting room somewhere to see this big man, let me be able to do that graciously, with, you know, with my time occupied. But it was a very short meeting. It was the most useless meeting. Nothing came out of it. There was no follow-up. 
in fact, in the end, I was like, was this just a hazing? Yeah. Like a type of it sounds like. Whether I was serious or not, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but anyway, that was the most dramatic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That sounds like it. It sounds like the party folks were like, let's get this young one. Let's get her. <laughs> uh-huh. Let's, let's check out. Let's see if she's committed. Let's exactly. See. Let's see. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So um, you have a new um, YouTube series that's, a, I think, a revival of it's, one that you, you initiated years ago. Tell us about that because it's in the context of, you know, commentary <laughs> on elections. Tell us tell us about that. I, I didn't share that with you. You've really done your homework for me. Oh, I wow. try. <laughs> <laughs> Well, to be honest, I think I consider myself a bit of a political junkie. I really okay. just... And when I lived in the States, I would follow Meet the Press. I know there are many people that like to hammer Meet the Press, but Meet the Press, that was in the early 2000s, not like the kind of Meet the Press. Then we didn't have this outright war between, you know, Fox News type yeah. and yeah. MSNBC. It was still more balanced. Yeah, So I I've agree. always sort of liked political news. I love listening to late night shows. The jokes that will crack me up the most are the ones that are political. Mm-hmm. Every time I see the New Yorker, any New Yorker compilation of political cartoons and jokes, I buy it. So yeah, I've always just sort of wanted to have my own talk about politics and i just thought the nigerian elections are coming it's going to be really a wild ride the incumbent is not going to be running so it's sort of like an open field in a way we're full of hope that anything can happen it's been a rough couple of eight years so say those of us who are not fans of the president of course fans of the president think he's done brilliantly but anyway we're all hoping that we'll do even better than he he was or he's been in 2023. So I just wanted to have my own spin. And so I've started doing just a rundown of what happened in the week and not even everything, just a few things because it's called, the program is called Political News in Five, PNI Five, which really is me in five minutes, just telling you a little bit of what has been the most talked about stuff in Nigerian politics um, the week before. So I record them on Sundays on my dining table and I post it out and yeah. yeah, so far it's fulfilling. It's me feeling connected. And it's funny when you talked about Glocal, I did say that, you know, I consider myself from here now and I am following British politics. I am aware of all the things that Boris is going, Boris Johnson is going through and his party. So I'm much aware of, and sometimes I do think about, is there an opportunity to link what's happening here with what's happening there? And I'm sure that will come with time. Yes. But yeah, Political News in yes. 5 is on YouTube and Instagram if you're following me there. Yes. Well, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll I have just that enjoy the- doing them. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll have that in the show notes. And I think I I think it's definitely very useful for particularly diaspora people, right? Like so it's a very a good offering for those who aren't in the news all the time and not on the ground yeah. listen to the radio and it's propaganda yeah. free, right? Because that's another yes. piece of being being local. You get a lot of propaganda and it's a little bit heavy, yeah. but I I appreciate yeah. your perspective which is the facts. And mm-hmm. issues to think about, right? So, you know, mm-hmm. think about this in a, in a more objective, I would say, manner. Yes. So if you are interested in Nigerian politics, in five, you can get snippets <laughs> every week. And so I'm assuming you're going to be doing this through 20, through the year up until the elections. Yes. I hope so, because sometimes, you know, <laughs> I, I'm surprised at how much it takes, like, to get just those yeah. five minutes done. Like I literally yeah. have to think up, I have to sort of go through the news, see what's happening, do a summary, think about what I want to say and then do it. It's just, it does take a lot, but I'm enjoying it for now. And fingers crossed, I can take it through all the way to 2023 and the elections and a little bit afterwards. And then we'll see where we are then. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We'll be looking out for it. I like, yeah, and it's true. We we appreciate that you have taken the time because I myself, I know it takes it takes time to create content. Yeah. You know, people who are these creators, you know, you see them doing all these things and it's like, it's not- I am in awe. Like, I am in complete awe of all content. I mean, like, I honestly, like now just because of these videos, I'm like, so all those things I laugh at on TikTok or Instagram, it takes time to put those it things does. together. It really does. It really does. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. Okay. So you're writing, you wrote the book, you've done the politics. And mm-hmm. and so I want to ask a little bit more, particularly given that you're working with an organization 
that has a lot of experience history within the region where we now have conflict going on. So just to kind of get an understanding of your focus is on Africa, but just thinking now in the political environment that we're dealing with economically as well, what are your thoughts on how Africa can be more resilient, number one, to the economic pressures of, of what's going on outside of our borders? And I guess really kind of hone in on empowering local people to be just more self-sufficient generally and a little bit more economically insulated from the fluctuations of global markets in this regard? Well, I mean, so I think that's a, a really good question. I mean, I'm thinking if there's a way that we can actually insulate ourselves from the from what's going on in, in the rest of the world. The world is so connected now. I mean, I know mm -hmm. that many of the conversations and articles are now about how weaponized our financial system has become all in the in the bid to contain Russia. So it makes me think whether we can insulate ourselves and if we want to insulate ourselves, you know, is it not a sense of wanting to insulate that has caused most of the problems that we have. But that said, mm -hmm. that said, I would say that honestly, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, we should be putting more energy into that. It, it mm. was something that we were all looking forward to when the African countries said they were going to do it. We finally got Nigeria to sign. But the pandemic has sort of swept that energy away. Yeah, um, It's been focused on the pandemic. It's been focused on all the other things that are happening, the climate change. And, and again, speaking to insulating, you know, how do we insulate ourselves when things that are happening thousands of miles away, the culture of carbon pollution and carbon management is affecting our own environment down in, in Mozambique where we're having floods and things, you know? So the truth is it, trying to insulate ourselves isn't probably going to work, even though I know that there are people who are saying, you know what, let's, let's take a lesson from what's happening with Russia. All Africans should be looking after their own economy and detaching themselves. And I'm sorry, I'm for responsible globalization. I'm for thinking mm -hmm. um, about the world problems collectively, not mm -hmm. in in isolation. There's too much populism and nationalism in the world right now for me to join that bad one. God. So, but I would say two things. The first is definitely the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. We need more movement of people in in, in Africa, honestly. Mm -hmm. the, when I mm -hmm. even, the little trade that I know of, between the West, the West, um, West Africa corridor between, you know, Burkina, Cote d'Ivoire, Bene, Ghana, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. If we could just open up more yeah. of those corridors, those trade yeah. corridors for people to just move, if, if people could feel safe, mm -hmm. that's the other thing. You know, it's one thing to create the good roads, it's one thing to create the corridors. Are people safe? There's mm -hmm. so much insecurity. And what is underlying the insecurity, obviously, is a mix of decades of underinvestment in people, decades of uh, underinvestment in public services, and, you know, also decades of plain ethnic and religious politics in all our African countries in a way that's made us so fragile and um, damaged our social cohesion in a way that makes us suspicious of each other. And when you think about the damage that Nigeria's closure of borders did to Bene, you know, for a couple of two years ago in the middle of the pandemic. So you know how interconnected we are. So I think for me, it's in addition, just governments trying to spend more on people. You know, we need to spend more on people. That sounds like a long term. Short term, we need to free up our uh, to what's the word I'm looking for? Democratize land ownership. I mean, mm. I think it sounds really basic, but if we want more people to farm, if and to be, I say mm -hmm. farm because I, I'm very aware that at least in Nigeria, farming has become a very dangerous thing because you go to your farm, if it's not the herders, it's the kidnappers. But mm. again, it comes down to if we want to be more food secure, if we don't want to suffer from food insecurity, considering climate, the impact of climate and impact on insecurity, then we're going to have to do something to keep people secure. We're going to have to come collectively to sort of secure our borders and maybe take a more regional approach to the insecurities that are happening. I think for me, those are then not none of them is, is quick fixes. And I know we like quick fixes, but there's none of them. And to be honest, I also think our government in Nigeria, not Nigeria, in Africa, need to be more responsible about how we're selling off our land to exactly. the Gulf states, yes, the Gulf exactly. states, to China. Exactly. We need to be more responsible about that. For me, yes. it's, you see, so it's doing that more than saying, how do we insulate ourselves? It's saying, no, if you want to come in and 
farm or whatever, <laughs> you farm with local people or you just buy exactly. our produce. You don't come mm-hmm. in and buy the land and farm it and take the things out. No, 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 no. Exactly. That's not how it exactly. works. But it's yeah. the corruption. It's the state mm-hmm. capture. And it comes back again to the cycle of, of elections. If we don't have a way of being able to hold these people accountable or throwing them out of office when they don't do the right things, then we will keep having these problems. Mm, I mean, absolutely. My my biggest concern with the concept of democracy is that I don't believe that most Africans actually understand democracy in the sense that 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 the West has envisioned it or created it. And so I'm with you in the sense that people need to be the, the dictator of their own fates, right, with the people that they choose. However, we've been, I want to say, we've had these systems projected onto us that leave us somewhat imp- disempowered because we also have these traditional um, systems that are still holding on, particularly around education and, you know, social cultural institutions that are keeping keeping us a little bit handcuffed, right? And so what would you say for, you know, a child or a community, what would be the crux of securing democracy or or injecting democracy in a way that Africans actually understand and can can embrace as their own? Mm. I mean, it's funny. It's one of the things that if I had luxury, I really want to explore it. Again, something I thought about recently is just, you know, where the concept of, we always credit the Greeks with the concept of mm-hmm. democracy. And mm. I, was, I was actually wondering, I was like, well, what are our own African concepts of democracy? Because I don't want to believe that the idea of democracy is foreign. You know, yeah. I, I'd like yeah. to think that yeah. the values, maybe the outward expression Mm-hmm. is foreign you know mm-hmm. the presidency the this the that maybe that outward expression is foreign but the concept of the fundamentals of democracy i think are local you know i, I think about in the oyo empire and the fact mm-hmm. that there were checks and balances mm-hmm. and unhappy people unhappy advisors could force an oba to drink hemlock to kill himself because they're literally saying we no longer trust you to lead us go Mm-hmm. You know, I think about the Igbo and their very egalitarian age group network where decisions are made and taken collaboratively. Okay, fine, women were not part of it, but <laughs> collaboratively, mm-hmm. you know. And so I really struggle with the sense that democracy is foreign because I just feel like democracy is human. Maybe democracy is not the right word, but any system that supports people having agency and mm-hmm. supports equality of opportunities and rights and protections for me it's human you know sure. from sure. time immemorial people have struggled for freedom there are no group of people ever anywhere in the world who've been slaves enslaved and never wanted to free themselves never right. tried never struggled yeah. so i think it's fundamental mm-hmm. so for me it's i honestly think that bad i do believe it's decolonizing our education i think that would definitely help i definitely Mm -hmm. think what's the crux for a young person in a community is decolonizing our education in the sense that makes us all look to the west for our problem for our solutions and even our problems Mm -hmm. and more teaching of what's our story our narratives and it's wonderful to see talking about content so much content coming up whether it's designers you know superheroes but I'm seeing a lot of content that will help the younger generation help our children's children to understand and take pride in our own stories in our own narratives and we've had struggle we've had struggle it's just not documented it's just not documented in a way that helps us see that democracy as a concept is not foreign maybe the way we've organized government yeah and governance is foreign you know taking the parliamentary system taking the right. presidential system sure. but we have our own systems but at the same time i don't want to romanticize the past because the past had many harmful p- practices for women you know so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i want mm-hmm. i see yeah i want progress in the sense that all human beings regardless of you know what their gender is or what you know they they have the same rights and equal opportunities and protections and yeah nobody to have too much power to be able to abuse it like we're seeing with Putin right now or we're seeing, Mm -hmm. you know, whether Mm -hmm. it's between the the war in Ethiopia, between the Tigray and the government of Ethiopia. And when you look at all these things, it's all about men just wanting to have power. And you keep asking yourself, what do they want to even do with this power? You take the power and 
what do you want to do with it? None of your countries is a paradise. You know, you want exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, you want this exactly. power for what? Yeah. You want yeah. to do what? Yeah. Just to yeah. oppress people so that you right. feel good. You can't feel good unless people are down. I really think that more women should be, honestly, not just saying it because it's the popular thing to do, but lately with everything that's happening in the world, I really think that true many states have lacked credibility now to talk about democracy you know and that's part of the problem with the war Mm -hmm. in in, Mm -hmm. in the war between it's not even a war between the attack on ukraine that russia has led because you know people say oh who is america to talk about this they've done that they have blood in their hands oh who is um you know and i look at it i'm like yeah pretty much almost every country has blood in their hands you know yes. even the countries that yes. haven't attacked other countries they've attacked their citizens you know whether right. they're using the state police to attack mm-hmm. their citizens mm-hmm. so if you put it that way nobody has a right and i'm like who else has a right more than women in the world to actually discuss democracy mm-hmm. and design and reimagine what democracy can be and come up with new or reimagined values for democracy and lead that space, you know, right. it would really be something that I would right. love to just see and right. Angela Merkel and, you know, Hillary and just different people and uh, you and me mm-hmm. saying, you know what, we don't have to sit around and wait for the men after they finish killing half the world to come up with a new way of moving forward. The mm-hmm. women should be meeting and saying, you know what, the world also belongs to us. Here is our own idea of how we should be going forward. Right. With democracy, considering right. that all the institutions are broken from the UN to the ECOWAS, the AU, they're all broken. Mm-hmm. How do mm-hmm. we design a new global consensus for democracy that's led by women's initiative? Honestly, yeah. why not? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love it. I want to. I want to be like <laughs> because it's the, I, I am a hundred percent behind that, and it's true. I think that speaking of, I want to mm-hmm. talk about my mindset hack. So. Okay. What is your favorite or an innovative mindset hack? And this is one that you can imagine, one that you practice or one that you know of. You have to tell yours because, you know, this is all very fancy to me. I'm a local girl from Zaria in Nigeria. What is a <laughs> mental mind hack? <laughs> um, okay, so I'd say that my standard mindset hack is meditation. So that's something that I do on a very regular basis. And it is also breathing, right? Like if I really need to change my mind, I'll sit and kind of just like inhale and, and different breathing techniques. But yeah, so those are those are kind of quick fix mindset hacks. But some people have more elaborate practices. Well, I mean, I've toyed with, and now you've made me just remember one of my long list of failures, but <laughs> no. I need to learn how to <laughs> Failing to learn how to meditate is going right up on the list. Yeah, a mindset hack. Honestly, I would think it's really just closing my eyes and yeah. Taking a break. Yeah. Yes. Getting up. Just getting up. Mm -hmm. Literally Mm -hmm. these days of being tied to our laptops, working from home 24 hours of the day, because while we are happy that we're not commuting, sometimes we don't sort of realize that, okay, we need to get up from where we are. And, you know, the break of going to work and coming home, something we took for granted, but it was a useful way of resetting. Now you're just at it for as long as your body allows you. And so for me, keeping my glass of water far away and Mm. having to get up yeah, having mm-hmm. to get up to go get it is mm-hmm. my way of resetting my body and my mind. But at night, I do try to run through the day. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's quite a reset, but I just try to, before I fall asleep, go through my day and see the things I'm, that made me happy and proud and the things I feel like I can do better. Mm. Um, that's pretty much it. And then when my youngest son was still at home and going to school from home every day and Mm -hmm. hopefully that will come back he's in boarding school now but hopefully only for a couple of a few more terms as we settle into london but i would make him say affirmations in the morning like okay good yeah Yeah. in front of a mirror he hated it but i was like i'm funny i'm smart i'm kind you know just yeah yeah and that's important for for kids too because they can you know bullies bullies are around the corner all the time you know i just realized that it's it's hard to break my heart yeah yeah yeah. so good for you on you know the affirmations that are the self-defense because that's really 
really what, mm-hmm. what we what we need for the young people. Okay, nice, 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 nice. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our conversation. This has been so wonderful. But before we go, we want to know who Aisha is when she's not being a justice warrior or making grants or traveling the world. How do you spend your leisure time? Are you a reader, a watcher, or are you a listener? All of the above. Oh my okay. God. I try. Okay. To, I know like a, a type A personalities like to do everything. So yes, I am constantly juggling at least two books. Right now I'm reading The Chancellor. It's a book about Angela Merkel, which has been really oh. quite entertaining. I really, I mean, and enlightening. So it's, uh-huh. you know, she, she's someone I've looked up to, but I don't know, you know, and I mm-hmm. I do know enough that these days, you know, when I, when you get up close to people you, you've looked up to for a long time, you usually find that they have feet of clay. Um, so, but reading the book, reading the book, reading the book has humanized her. There are things yeah. about her that I don't agree with, positions she's taken, but it's yeah. made her more real to me. And I still feel immense respect for her and yeah. The person who wrote her story and I'm thinking of writing a biography of someone as well so this has been useful for me Mm -hmm. just thinking Mm -hmm. about how someone else writes someone else's story Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm also Mm -hmm. reading so I think that's it I'm reading I try to read one fiction one non-fiction yeah same here mm -hmm. yeah and then in terms of movies I'm I'm a movie buff so I'm trying to catch up with the Oscar buzz just so that when the conversations are happening I know what's going on Mm -hmm. Um, I have an opinion on the Oscar movies and yes they deserve it or no they didn't deserve it so I've watched King Richard that when it first came out but then yesterday I watched uh, The Tragedy of Macbeth which got Denzel the best Oscar nomination Uh very powerful very powerful And I watched Koda, which is a Best Picture nomination also. So uh-huh. I do like watching movies and I try sure. to watch movies on the weekends. And I also just, I like oldies. Sometimes I just want to laugh when I watch Frasier. Oh, I yeah. Watch, yeah. I love Frasier. <laughs> I, love, I love Modern Family. So, yeah. 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 Those are good I ones. like indie movies. Yes, I like indie movies. I'm, yeah. And then podcasts, I'm listening constantly to, well, BBC Focus, just the news pretty much, mm-hmm. just to know what's mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. That's my background as I do my chores. So living in London is a life of doing your own chores. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Everything has its options. Everything has its pluses and minuses. But yes, my my usual background is and even music. Sometimes I music is for exercising typically. And okay. Podcast okay. is for just doing the housework. And then Got movies it. is for settling down after a long day and our long week. And okay. Enjoy. And then reading is morning and in the evening. Just so Got everything. It. everything. I received you make time. That's good. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Ah, this has been so nice. That. I feel like I've I've gained a new sister in the, the justice warrior so. space. Yeah. 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 No, listening to you talk about how you like doing content for kids, I'm like, okay, here's a partner. I need to find mm-hmm. her and mm-hmm. discuss mm-hmm. what we can Absolutely, about absolutely. Content. Yeah, <laughs> we should we'll pick it up, especially for, for African children. I mean, that is our Yes, of course. That is our future. That is who we have to be. So, so yeah, I'm so happy that, so folks, one of our former um, guests actually made a recommendation and connected us with Aisha. So we'll thank Kehinde, who is, I'll, I'll have show notes for his episode so that you can review that as well. Shout out to Kehinde Togo for the connection and thank you, Florence, all you do. Thank you for your local podcast, for capturing our stories. It's, i Full respect to you. Thank you for doing this for us. It's not easy. And I, but I, I'm sure it's rewarding. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. To meet people like you. So, all right, folks, this has been another episode of Global Citizens. You can catch new episodes every Tuesday at globalcitizenspod.com and wherever you get your podcast. Please like, share, subscribe, follow us on social media and, uh, tell a friend. That's the way it works. So until next time, bye for now.